We are going to do a lot more graphing in a few sections, but in this section we're really just talking about graphs and different properties, not really how to graph the non clueless method. So we'll learn that um, definitely in 1.7. So we're going to look at other properties of the graph. We'll look at domain and range now. No, we won't look at domain and range. So I'll say general rule in the clueless method. I will say usually graph uh, x values in the interval negative 5 to 5. That's a pretty good interval of x values to graph in. We only did negative 2 to 2. A lot of times you don't need to go all the way from negative 5 to positive 5. And this is a good time to talk about intervals and intervals notation. So interval notation is how you're going to enter your answers on web work and it's also how you're going to ed, uh, write your answers for quizzes and midterms. So there we'll start with closed intervals. So closed intervals are written with square brackets. So this interval from A to B, this is all numbers uh, between A and B, including the endpoints. And more specifically, all real numbers. Between A and B, including A and B. And if you are comfortable with set builder notation, which we're not going to use too often in this class, but if you want the set builder notation, it looks like x, so all real numbers x, such that a is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to b. So that would be a way to write it out in set builder notation. A lot of times in set builder notation, you don't see the uh, that little symbol right there in the real numbers. I don't think I've written this down before in this class yet. So I'll talk about those symbols right there. So this right here means is an element of. And this weird capital R that has two vertical lines on it, uh, this is called a bold, uh, bold R. And this is the real numbers. And I don't want to get too deep into uh, numbers, but real numbers are basically all the decimal numbers, including the ones that go on forever. So those are two new symbols right there. And that first one is also known as an epsilon in uh, the Greek alphabet. So that little e is an epsilon. You also could see it written like that as well. So it depends on who's, who's writing as to how they're going to write it. So it can look very much like a backwards 3 or kind of like a, I don't know what you would call the other one, a really poorly drawn arrow. All right, so that is closed intervals and open intervals. So open intervals use parentheses or you could say round brackets. So this is all real numbers between A and B. And 
and this is not counting, not including the endpoints. And set builder notation, not very exciting to write down. Any real number such that it's between A and B. So it's the same set builder, just no equal signs in there. So that's closed, open, and you can of course have mixed endpoints. So you could have it closed on one side, open on the other, or open on one side, closed on the other. So if we have the first one, which number are we allowing, A or B, in the first interval here that I wrote down, in this interval? So you're allowed to have B, but you're not allowed to have A. So in set builder, all real numbers that are greater than A, less than or equal to B. And the second interval I wrote down, we're allowed to now use A, but no longer B. So those are, uh, for reasons deeper than I want to get into, those are not called open and closed. They're actually neither open or closed, but we can just call them intervals and not worry about exactly what we call each one, as long as we know what it means to include the endpoints or not include the endpoints. Now, number lines can be very useful. So how do you draw these out with a number line? If you have a closed interval, there's my real number line. A always has to be a less than B, or these don't make any sense. So you have A, B on a number line, normally we would just shade in that middle part right there. Looks kind of like a barbell, like that. <clears throat> I find that it's a little, I prefer to use this notation where I actually put uh, square brackets in here. That makes me feel a little better about writing down the interval. Then I don't waste so much ink filling in all the circles. Uh, open intervals, still on a number line, you still have A and B, but open intervals, the standard way to write them is you use empty dots, or dots that don't have a center. And then you shade in the middle part again, like this. So that's how you would normally write an open interval. I prefer to write like this, so just use rounded uh, parentheses. So either way, you can write open and closed intervals. Mixed, of course, is going to be open on one side, closed on the other. So you just mix the two uh, end notations together. So those are intervals. And we also are going to sometimes describe sets of numbers that are not just between two, but maybe there's uh, between 0 and 2, and maybe also between 8 and 10. So we want to talk about two separate intervals. And that gets into unions. So what are unions? You've seen a Venn diagram before. So let's say this set is called C and this set is called D. The union is everything in C or in D. So C, U, D, this is C union, D, this is everything in C and also everything in D. And if you're in C and D, that's OK, too. Uh, you'd be inside of both. So there's unions right there. And if we color it in, you just shade in the entire region right there. So you get everything in a union. 
We're not going to do intersections much, but you can't talk about unions if you don't talk about intersections. So if we have the same C and D, so intersections looks just like the union symbol, except it's flipped upside down. So to me, it looks a lot like an N with no tail on it. And this is C intersection or intersected with D. It's probably better to just write intersect. And this is all elements that are in both C and D. color in. This is just the football shape region right in the middle. So there's intersections. And the next topic is intercepts of a graph. And we'll start with x-intercepts and think about those, and then we'll look at y-intercepts afterwards. So intercepts Where do x-intercepts appear on a graph? So our x-intercepts are always going to appear right on the x-axis. So it may appear over here on the left may appear right in the middle, may appear on the right side, or anywhere in between. So they can appear all over the x-axis. What do all these points have in common? If I wrote out some coordinates, there's something I could definitively say about, about one of the two coordinates for each point I wrote down. So it seems like the x-value should be zero, because they're called x-intercepts. But we can see that x value is different on all three points. One of them has x value 0. But they all have, they're not lifted up or down at all. So they have a height 0 or a y coordinate of 0. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. When you see x intercept, you have to think, oh, that means the y coordinate is 0, meaning the height would be 0. So x intercepts have y coordinate equal to 0. So all these points, whatever the x values are, they're going to look like x comma 0. So it could have different x values, but you're definitely going to have 0 in for your y value. So those are x-intercepts. And y-intercepts, when we get into functions, which is very soon, you would only have maximum one y-intercept. And we'll see why when we get into functions. For now, we're graphing equations that don't need to be functions, so we could have multiple y-intercepts. So what property do all the y-intercepts have? That's right. They have their x-coordinate or their horizontal coordinate 0. So don't move left or right at all. So they have x-coordinate. equal to 0, and they're all going to be of the form 0, comma, some y value. So those are how we know we're looking at intercepts. And now what we're going to do is take an equation and without graphing it, figure out where's the x-intercepts and where's the y-intercepts. And we know how to, the x-intercepts happen when y is 0. So we're going to use that with an equation to figure out exactly what points are on the x-axis. So our equation is going to be x minus 1 squared plus y squared equals 0. So we have an equation. I want to find the 
x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. And I want to write these as points. So we'll come back and write our answers in those blanks. All right, let's go for x-intercepts first. So what we know about x-intercepts, we just said they have a y-coordinate of 0. So they're right there at the top of the screen. So if we have an x-intercept, it's going to have to have a y-coordinate of 0. So first, set y equal to 0. So we're going to see what x values uh, make this satisfy this equation when y is 0. And a very useful thing to do in math is use a little asterisk when you want to refer to something else that you don't want to keep writing. The original equation, the original equation, the original equation. So I'm going to satisfy that equation right there at the top that I'm using an asterisk to refer to. So I'm going to rewrite it. And I'm going to substitute in 0 for y. So here's a good time to test your algebra skills. So go ahead and solve this. So tell me what x value or values, or if there's no x values that make this true. And this is really just a quadratic. So you've been doing this since your algebra class. Okay, so who foiled? Only one? I believe probably about half of you foiled. All right. So you can foil, and then you probably did some either quadratic formula or factored in some way and got some x values. So I think you should get 0 and 2 are the two x values that you should have. So I'm going to teach you a slightly different way to think about algebra. You have been trained to always FOIL whenever you see a binomial squared. And whenever you see a plus b squared or a minus b squared, you've just been trained to FOIL that out automatically. So the way I want you to think about solving, eventually at the bottom, your last step should look like x equals something. And then in this one, you got another x equals something else. So you want to get x by itself, x equals whatever's on the other side. So let's think of a different way to get there. I'm going to go ahead and FOIL here. How many places do you, does x appear now? Two. Two. So it's, remember, it's my goal to get x by itself. So what I just did is I did a completely legal algebra move, but now I made x appear two separate places. So I actually made the problem more complicated. 
So this is correct, but I don't want to go this route because I'm going to have to do some more algebra after that. So if you didn't FOIL that plus 0 squared, that doesn't matter. So if you didn't FOIL, what was another option here? So let's think about eliminating all of x's friends. So it has a minus 1, and there's also an exponent up here. So what do I get rid of first? The exponent. So you've got to get rid of the exponent first. And that comes from PEMDAS. So you've probably seen this before. The only time you have to follow PEMDAS is if you're evaluating uh, arithmetic expressions. Then you have to go parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. When you're doing algebra, you do not have to follow this. However, you do have to uh, do algebra correctly. And generally, if you're in doubt, go uh, when you're doing algebra. So arithmetic goes up on this scale. Generally, algebra, you're going to be going downwards here. So when in doubt, Wait, is that right? Oh, I have this completely wrong. Wow. Arithmetic, you do parentheses first, you go down the order. And algebra, you go up the order, like that. So it looks like I should be doing the subtraction first, but the problem is it's grouped inside the parentheses. So I cannot just go and add one to both sides. Uh, the way I like to think about it is you're making an ice sculpture. And, or any type of uh, sculpture, and you're basically breaking off pieces of ice or wood or rock. And so what's the first piece? You have to break that piece, the square off, before you can get to that minus 1. So we square root both sides. And we get plus or minus 0. Is that right? I think I need the plus minus on the other side. But this only gets me the two solution. How does it give you the two solution? Something is weird. So x minus 1 equals 0. Oh, there is only one solution. What am I talking about? OK, yeah. So there is only one solution. So x equals 1. So using quadratic uh, formula is wrong. Zero. No, it, uh, as long as you got one, you're OK. All right, so x equals 1, and our point is 1, 0. So I'm just taking the y-coordinate we got before with this x-coordinate and wrapping up in a single point. So we got 1, 0 is our x-intercept. So just writing that up top. All right, next up, we're going to look for our y-intercept. And for y-intercept, we're going to set x equal to 0. Now, are there any questions on the finding our x-intercept right there, 1, 0? So our y-intercept, we're going to set x equal to 0. So I'm copying down the original equation, x minus 1 squared plus y squared equals 0. And now I'm subbing in 0 for x. So minus 1 squared is positive 1. So now y squared equals negative 1. And here's where we have a problem. So if we work in the real numbers, we cannot have a negative square root, or a square root of a negative. So this would mean no solution, or no real solution. But for us, this is no solution. B 
because, and I'll use the red marker here, because of that negative in front of the one. So if you have a square root of negative value, that's not a real number. So <clears throat> algebraically, this is no solution. The original question said, what are the y-intercepts? So algebraically, we get no solution. What does that mean about y-intercepts? No y-intercepts. So right up here, so there's none. So we're just going to write none, or there are no y-intercepts. So you're going to find pre-calculus classes very much using algebra to answer uh, to answer more deeper mathematical questions. Uh, so we're not we're definitely using algebra, but not exclusively algebra. So you want to make sure you answer the question that was originally asked. And now we're going to move on to symmetry. And we'll start with x-axis. So for symmetry, what I'm going to do is draw an example of what x-axis symmetry looks like. So this is basically a mirror image. And in this case, it's across the x-axis. So it would look something like that. Do your best to make it a mirror image across the x-axis. So that's what x-axis symmetry looks like. So whatever happens above the x-axis, it happens also below the x-axis. Now, how do we match this up in some algebraic way? So when we think about things matching up, let's think about points. So we have these two points that would correspond. And let's say the first one just has coordinates x comma y. What would the coordinate of the corresponding point be on that bottom curve if you knew that first one was x, y? Negative x. So which coordinate should turn to negative? Only the y. So if we think about the x-coordinate, better not move left or right, or else we're not going to be looking at the point directly below. So this other coordinate is going to have regular x, negative y. So that's how it's going to look. So algebraically, you have x-axis symmetry if x, comma, y is on the graph. exactly when x comma negative y is on the graph. And what does it mean to be on the graph? The actual definition. It had to do with the equation. So you're on the graph if you satisfy the equation. So if we think about what does it mean for this to be on the graph, what it means here is if x, y satisfies the equation, then x negative y also satisfies the equation. So that means you can take y and replace it with negative y, and you should get the exact same equation. So that's how we're going to test for this. So we're going to replace y by negative y, and if the equation is unchanged, we have x-axis symmetry. So that's how we're going to test for x-axis symmetry. And we'll look at y-axis next.
So y-axis symmetry, whatever happens on the left side of the y-axis, the mirror image happens on the right side. So do your best to draw a curve that looks the same on both sides. And we're going to do the same thing we did last time. Just think about corresponding points. So if you'd have one on the left, you'd have some corresponding point on the right side as well. So if I told you the one on the left was x comma y, what would that corresponding point be on the right side? Yeah, negative x and keep your y value. You don't want to change the height. So we're going to go negative x comma y. So if x, y is on the graph, so x, y is on the graph exactly when x, uh, negative x, y. And our test is going to look almost identical to the previous test. So we're going to replace x by negative x. And I'll just write dot, dot, dot. So if we get the same equation, then we have uh, y-axis symmetry. And there's a third type of symmetry. And is what we call origin. So there's two ways to think about origin symmetry. Uh, one of them is if you rotate halfway around the origin. That's probably the standard way to think about it. So if you just put your pen or pencil on your paper and rotate it halfway, you should be looking at the same graph. Uh, the other way, you could think of it with two reflections, and across the y-axis and then across the x-axis. But that's a lot harder to think about, because you have to do two uh, mirror images at the same time. So the best way to think about it is a half rotation around the origin. So here's one example of that. You could have a graph like this, where you basically have whatever's in the first quadrant could rotate down and be uh, that curve in the third quadrant if you rotate halfway. Now this is a little more tricky to see how the, the points are related. So don't write the green points down which of those three points most likely corresponds to x, y C. with a rotation? C. So it'll be the point C down there. So it's a little bit tricky to see. Ha ha. So that's our point down there that corresponds. Anybody want to guess at the coordinates? If you know that first one's x, y. That's right, negative x, negative y. So let's look at the x coordinate first. So that first one's x, and then going on the other side of the y axis, you would get negative x. So that would be the x coordinate at that point. And something very similar happens. There's regular y, and then negative y is going to appear across the x-axis down there. So this one is negative x comma negative y. So that's what your uh, corresponding point will look like. So when we write down the, um, the points on the graph, so x, y is on the graph exactly when negative x, negative y is on the graph.
So now we're going to find all symmetries of the graph of y equals 4x squared divided by x squared plus 1. So we are going to test all three symmetries here. The good news is once we get into functions, x-axis symmetry is pretty much out. And I'll tell you why. It'll be pretty clear when we get there why x-axis symmetry you're not going to need to test for. It won't pass vertical line test for being a function. Uh, but we're not dealing with functions yet. We still just have equations. So we're going to run the uh, x-axis test first. So x-axis, we're going to replace. Now let's say you're on your quiz and you're trying to find x-axis symmetry and you can't remember. Does that mean the x-coordinate flips to negative or the y-coordinate flips to negative? Here's what I recommend you do. Just think, well, what does x-axis symmetry mean? Well, it means if I bring it across the x-axis, I'll get the same thing. So you can think, ah, that would be those two points corresponding right there. And what's the difference between these points? Their x-coordinate's the same, but their y-coordinate flips to be negative. So I recommend, uh, also, no, don't just memorize the, uh, just how to do it, but also remember, try to remember what does actually mean. So you'll be able to go back to that idea. So here we'd have x, y, and this one down here, x, negative y. So we're going to replace y with negative y. So we have negative y equals 4x squared over x squared plus 1. Now, there wasn't really much to do here. There's only one place y appeared. If you want, you can multiply both sides by negative 1. So you can move that negative over to the right side. Now, is that the same equation as what we started with at the top of the board? No. Nope. It, basically, one side became negative, not both sides. So this is not the same equation. So not the same equation as asterisk as the one we started with. So we do not get x-axis symmetry. So that was our x-axis test. Now we're going to do the y-axis test. Now if you're on a quiz and you still can't remember, should I switch x with negative x or y with negative y? If you got the first one, you feel good about that. This is just the opposite. You just switch the opposite coordinate now. So we're going to place x with negative x. So I see x in two different places. So let's be careful that we swap it out. Both places, you have to treat all the x's the same. You can't just treat one one way and the other some other way. So what did I do wrong here? So I have to basically I have to enforce order of operations. So I want to make sure I square not just x, but I square the entire negative x. So I need to, and also it looks like I'm subtracting if I leave it. Uh, if I leave it in this form, it looks like I'm taking 4 and then subtracting x squared, which is completely different than what we started with. So we need to group that together and do something similar for the other negative x. So we need to make sure we're going to square the negative. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify this. So negative x times negative x, that's just positive x squared. So that'll take care of that negative sign. And down below, same thing happens. We have a negative x squared. That's the same as regular x squared. So the fact that both of the x's were squared or raised to an even power, the negative doesn't have any effect on them. So this is our original uh, equation here. So we do get y-axis symmetry.
So as a y-axis, now we'll look for origin. So origin is where you do both x with negative x and y with negative y. And I could scroll back up to see the original, but all I'm really going to do is take this right here. I've already got the negatives in for x, and I'm just going to put a negative in for y also. And the right side simplifies down just like it did the first time. But the left side still have that negative y. So it's not going to be the same because there's a negative on one side. So not the same as the original, so we get no origin symmetry. So I'll give you a little logical shortcut that will help out a little bit. It's not terribly useful until, we, until you do polar graphing uh, next quarter. But you cannot have two symmetries. You either get no symmetry, one symmetry, or all three. So you cannot just have two symmetries. Or it's not just you, but there can never exist just two symmetries. So the possibilities are no symmetries, one, or all three. So we'll do one last example, and I'll give you about three minutes to do this. Get as far as you can. Find all intercepts and symmetries. Of x cubed minus x equals y. So go for the intercepts first, and symmetry is second. And I always recommend just start with x-intercepts, and then do y-intercepts afterwards. So find your intercepts first. Some of these might be super easy algebra, other ones slightly less easy. This is not a quadratic, it's a cubic. So don't use quadratic formula. It's not a quadratic. So you can't use your quadratic formula here. It's a good time if you have any questions to ask them.
All right, so some of you are stuck on algebra, so let's go ahead and get started here. I right, saw so almost all of you get this part right. x cubed minus x equals 0. All right, so just put in 0 for, for y. Now, what to do after this? So my favorite f word is factor. At least during math class, it's factor. So what can I factor out of here? So factor out an x. So we get this. Now, you've used the zero product property before. But what the zero product property says, you get two uh, terms multiplying to make zero. It means one of the terms or both the terms are zero. There is no other number that has a nice property like this for multiplication. If two things multiply to make five, you don't know really much about them. One of them might be a fifth, and the other might be 25, might be 1 and 5, might be there's an infinite number of possibilities. So zero product property, we're going to use whoa, right here. So that means either x is 0 or x squared minus 1 equals 0. So x equals 0. OK, that's already solved. What about x squared minus 1 equals 0? How can I figure out what x needs to be? x needs to be 1. So x would need to be 1. So I could add the 1 to the other side and then square root. So that would be a pretty good move. x squared equals 1. So x squared, uh, oops, regular x equals plus or minus 1. So you want to make sure you don't throw away solutions. Just because your brain says, oh, 1 works, well, that may not be the only number that works there. So 1 works, and also negative 1 works. So plus or minus 1, that's x equals 1, or x equals minus 1. So we're really getting three uh, x-intercepts, and we write them as points. We got 0, 0, 1, 0, and negative 1, 0. So there's really three x-intercepts. When we get further into polynomials, hopefully you will be able to tell right away that there could be up to three solutions here because it's degree 3. So you could get up to that many solutions. If it's degree 4, you could have up to four solutions. So we'll go, we'll do the, uh, the second part of this tomorrow.